Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. ESV. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it, it had been told them. Joy to the world. Luke's narratives provide the most detailed description of Jesus' birth and its surrounding events. The gospel writer records the angelic announcements of John the Baptist's birth to Zechariah, then Jesus' birth to Mary. Mary's song of praise and Zechariah's prophecy are wondrously recounted in our account given to us by Luke. The births of John the Baptist and that of Jesus are not left to the reader's imagination. Throughout, the author expresses the mercy of God and the salvation of God visible in the coming of Jesus. Have you noticed, though, the theme of joy that spreads throughout the narratives in Luke chapter 1 and 2? Joy occurs more often in Luke than in Matthew and Mark combined. And it's a pattern that Luke desires to see connected to Jesus' arrival and his birth. Observe the notes of joy documented by Luke. The angel told Zechariah that Elizabeth will be with a son and you shall call his name John and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. When Mary greeted Elizabeth and Elizabeth heard the greeting, John the Baptist leaped with joy in Elizabeth's womb. Mary responded by rejoicing in God, her Savior. The time came for Elizabeth to give birth. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that she was going to give birth to a son in her old age, they rejoiced at the idea that this woman was going to be blessed by God. As the angel proclaims to the shepherds the good news of great joy that is going to be present in that <coughs> excuse me going to be present in that manger they, re they didn't rejoice at that time but they rejoiced later on at the birth of this baby that was proclaimed to them by these angels. This morning, we're going to look at four reasons why we should rejoice in Jesus' arrival. First of all, our problem of sin is solved with the birth 
of Jesus Christ. Verse 8 reads, in the same region, shepherds were staying in the fields, feeding their flocks by night. And the shepherds are doing the things that they would normally do. They were rotating in and out, taking care of the sheep that was under their responsibility. This appearance to the shepherds seems odd and out of place. It would seem that the shepherd, being the lowest of those in this society, would not be those that would receive the message of a Messiah coming. What do we know? What we know about shepherding is that it's a lonely, isolated job. It's for those who are less in this society than those who had the opportunity, like Caesar Augustus and Governor Quirinius, mentioned at the beginning of Luke chapter 2. You would have thought that the announcement would have gone to one of the kingdoms or the leadership in the church. Those, the priests, are the rulers in the synagogue. Those who were scribes are Pharisees. Yet shepherds who are at the bottom of the scale of power and privilege are the first to hear about how God became man. In this ordinary evening as the shepherds and are doing their ordinary routine, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Angels play a prominent role in Luke chapter 1 and 2. They are mentioned numerous times. The angel here is not named and there are those accounts that Gabriel is mentioned three times in Luke chapter 1. The appearance of the angel causes fear among the shepherds. God's presence is displayed in the angel's appearance and the shepherds have the same response that we see throughout scripture. Everyone who encounters the angel have fear and trembling. That's what sinners do when they are exposed to the holiness of God. The shepherd's terror recalls the response of Zechariah in chapter 1 verse 12 when he was terrified and was overcome with fear when the angel met him in the temple and resembles that of Mary when she was deeply troubled when the angel came with the announcement that you would be impregnated by the Holy Spirit and you would have a child. This terror testifies to our greatest problem. We are sinners in need of a savior. We are sinners in need of a savior that can cleanse us of all our sins. We need God's mercy and salvation because we are rebels unable to satisfy God's wrath. We need somebody else to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The shepherds are not to fear though. The angel wants to reassure them, wants to encourage them and let them know, don't be afraid. For look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Why are the shepherds not to be fearful? Why are we not to be fearful? Because the angel brings a message of joy and not judgment. Though judgment is rightly deserved by those who have rebelled against God, joy is going to be the experience of those who submit to his will and to his way. Those who submit to Christ will have peace with God that blows our mind. 
In Jesus, the sinner's great fear of condemnation has been replaced by great joy in God. The angel continues, Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. The good news has everything to do with who Jesus is. He is the Davidic king born in the city of David, that is Bethlehem. He is Jesus, a savior, born for sinners, who is the true judge and deliverer of God's people. By identifying Jesus as savior, the angel is calling attention to Jesus' divinity and equality with God the Father, who was called savior by Mary in chapter 1, verse 47. Jesus is also the Messiah, the Christ prophesied of old. He is the anointed one and awaited one who fulfills all the expectations and prophecies of the Old Testament. He is the Lord of all. The title Lord in the Old Testament is often used as a covenant name for God. So Jesus is not simply the Messiah of the Lord, but Messiah who is the Lord. Jesus possesses God's sovereignhood and lordship. He is the sovereign one who rules over all the universe as king. In each term, the angel is declaring Jesus as greater than any king that has ever existed in this earth. The angel proclaimed Jesus as the true son of God, the only savior who can and has overcome sin in our lives. He's the one who came and sacrificed his life so that you and I could have that relationship with God. Advent reminds us that our Savior is on the scene in biblical history and will come back again. The saving acts of God anticipated by Yahweh in the Old Testament are realized in the coming of Jesus. Why should we rejoice in Jesus' arrival? Our problem is that we are sinners who deserve the wrath of God and has been solved by God's action. God shows us, I loved you before you were thought of. I loved you before you were even considered. I loved you so much that I allowed my son to come here and die for you. Not just for you, but for all who would put their trust and their faith in the God who created heaven and earth. Our problem is solved of sin by God's action, sending his son here to die for us. Our participation Second of all, is enabled by sovereign election. Upon the angel's declaration of good news, a multitude of angels erupt into praise, praising God for sending his son, praising God, glory to God in the highest, heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. The heavenly army attributes God's glory in heaven for his saving work and declares spiritual peace on earth for God's people, those he has favor for, those who have submitted to his will, those who have turned control of their life over to God. He offers a special favor. We understand that peace with God is a consequence of being declared right through faith in Jesus Christ. 
For those who willfully put their trust in Christ, they have peace with God. Peace that goes beyond anything that we could understand. In verse 14, a distinction of our peace with God is stated. It says, peace on earth to people God favors. In short, this favor refers to the doctrine of election. God's work of sovereign choosing precedes our faith. In the order of salvation, predestination leads to justification. Salvation then is not a reward for those who have goodwill, but a gracious gift to those who are objects of God's saving affection. Peace on earth will be experienced by those who've been numbered from eternity among God's chosen people. Embedded in this most famous Christmas text is the overwhelming truth that God has loved his people with an unbreakable love that began in eternity past and will carry forward into eternity future. He loved you before you were thought of. He loved you before the sperm and the egg united. He loved you before your mom and dad even thought about getting together. He loved you then and he loves you even right now. God's love for his people has never had a beginning and it will never have an ending. His favor on the elect was not predicated on anything that you could do, not predicated on anything that I could do. No matter how wonderful everybody might think you are, it will have nothing to do with your goodness. It was only by the goodness of God that he allowed for his son to come and die for us. First of all, our problem with sin is solved. And second of all, it is by his sovereign election that we have this opportunity. Thirdly, God promises are not a thing of fiction. Luke 28 and 20 breaks into two parts. Verses 8 through 14 record a heavenly response to the angelic pronouncement. Verses 15 through 20 record an earthly response to the angelic announcement. Verse 15 says, When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and they found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. The angel promised them earlier a baby lying in a manger and the shepherds found it that way. Jesus, the son of God, was born in a feeding trough in an animal room. Though he was born a king, he was not reared in a palace. From his earliest moments, Jesus' humble origins pointed him to a humiliating death in the place of you and I. He came down. He lowered himself, but he remained God the Son. The shepherds joined in the heavenly chorus of praise in verse 20. They returned after they saw him, after they witnessed him, they returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen. It was just as they had been told by the angels. And God revealed himself to the shepherds and his words became true. God's promises are not a thing of fiction. 
the truthfulness of God's word expressed in Luke chapter 2 is carried throughout the Bible. The scripture accurately testifies to the birth of Jesus. The scripture testifies to the life of Jesus. The scripture testifies to all the miracles that are recorded in the Bible and there are many more which were never recorded in the Bible. The Bible declares the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He came, he died, but he got up with all power in his hand. And the return of Jesus, as well as every other detail found in the Bible, is accurate and true. Jesus' incarnation is not some fairy tale or mythological story. His birth happened on a real day in history, on a day when Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome. It happened in a real city called Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem, six miles from Jerusalem, which still exists. God can be trusted. Every prophecy will come true. Every threat will be followed upon. Every blessing will be experienced. The shepherds saw and heard exactly as they had been told. They witnessed what happened that day in Bethlehem, which the Lord had made known to them. Christian, oh Christian, have you not found Jesus to be just what the Bible says he is? This passage says that Jesus gives us peace. Have you not been able to find peace in the midst of a storm? This passage says that Jesus gives joy. Have you not experienced the joy of the Lord in your life? The Bible assures us that Jesus will come back again with his powerful angels. Will we not be a witness to his return? Our joy in God is fixed because the God word of God is true. He cannot lie. Our future joy is as unwavering as the scripture. All our hopes in God will come true. He has gone to prepare a place for you and for me. Streets paved with gold. He's gone to prepare a place for you and for me. No more sickness. No more aches and pains. No more suffering. No more dying. We'll be praising and glorifying him all the day long. Our problems have been solved. Our participation has been given. And the Lord has allowed for us to be a part of the works that he has put before us. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Joy to the world. He has come and he's coming again. Joy to anybody who has not accepted him as Lord of your life. He is coming back again. And it's not too late for you to join this Christian band. It's not too late for you to enlist in the army of the Lord. He brings joy. He gives strength. He gives hope. He helps us make it from day to day. This morning, there may be one who has not submitted to his will or his way. There are those sitting amongst you who will testify to what God has done for them. There are those sitting amongst us who can declare to all that there is a Lord and Savior and he lives within them. He lives within our heart. We know he is all that the Bible has declared. And if there be one here this morning you may come and submit to him. Give your hand 
to us, but give your heart to the Lord and trust him and believe.